Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners, macabre murders and captivating crimes from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 206. It is, marvellously. It is. And happy solstice to you, sir. And merry solstice to you. At the time of mm. recording, it is the summer it is solstice. The summer solstice. And the sun has actually come out. It has. It indeed. has. It's, it's not freezing anymore. No, which is very encouraging. Which is very nice. Yes. We... I'm also slightly concerned that the big door is open. Oh, the actual... The actual <laughs> not, not the big door in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> not the big door to your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but the big, the big door in the room. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I just wasn't quite sure what you meant yes. there. And I was like... No, I was just thinking there may be unexpected loudnesses. Oh, there could be. Well, there's unexpected smells. People are cooking mm-hmm. delicious things, which is distracting. So probably we should close the door for two reasons. Yes. That we are not, there's no noise and there's not delicious smells and that no tempt us that we float out of the window. We don't like noise or smells. There we are. The door is closed. No sound will penetrate. There will be no sound or smells. No sound or smells. There'll be terrible sights. As- <laughs> <laughs> it has taken us a while to get this started. It has been, yes. We've been warming up for about... Two hours now. We do do a little warm-up recording before we do this show, and that is a privilege that our Sinai connoisseurs get to listen to I think each privilege week. is a strong word for it. Uh, I, mean, we, I mean, the numbers are going up. <laughs> People have heard tell of our ramblings. And it is just us rambling, getting all the crazy thoughts, the cobwebs out, mm. and just having a discussion. It got onto Greek gods. Uh, I mean, as it often does. As it often does, and got yeah. into weird places, yeah, but, yeah. which is always good. As soon as it's gone to a weird place, we know we're ready to record. <laughs> but how are you, Nick, otherwise? I'm fine. Gone, I've gone to weird places. It's fine. <laughs> gone to weird places. Yeah. We're, we're all good. <laughs> we were getting in the zone, and we thought, we'll have a couple of drinks. <laughs> I think this will come back to haunt us. But Possibly, it, yes. when reading is involved. But any poisonings this week? Probably not. Probably not? Probably no. not. No, I I'm, off. I'm off. I've You're had, off? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've had a day off work. I've not been at work. Yeah. I've got a day off work tomorrow. <gasps> Two whole days off work, that and is, then a weekend. That is That's four sweet. days not being at work. Four day weekend. Oh, what are you going to do? But, uh, well, well, I wrote an episode. You wrote an episode today. Yes, it's, it's done now. It's done, sorted. Tomorrow, I wasn't say I'm going to upload a load, of, load of episodes to the website. I'm going to get like, that stuff done. And now I'm thinking, fuck it, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sit in my pants all day. Yeah. I'm going to find some films. I'm going to eat a lot of snacks. Oh, good crunchy snacks. Crunchy snacks. Uh, with a, with a soft, soft snacks, dip, any any man, <laughs> however they come, I'm gonna. <laughs> however they appear to however you, however they appear, I'm gonna go for it, and I'm just gonna do absolutely nothing. I think you should. I yeah. think you've earned a day off, and I look forward to it. Yeah, I'm going to edit this episode. <laughs> Probably, definitely, will get up for the sunrise for solstice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, we'll if, if I happen to wake up at four a.m., then I'll get yeah, up. As I often do, I do often wake up at four a.m. <laughs> do you get out of bed and go, "Oh, let's look at the sun." Well, no, there's no reason to most of the other time. I'm just cursing the sun. Then, <laughs> but if I wake up and kind of go, oh yeah, and run up to the top of the hill, then 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 I might, I might. Yeah. See, you had me at a sort of, oh, I, I happen to wake up. It's four o'clock. I might open the window and go, ooh. Then you said, run up to the top of the hill. Well, get the good view. It's not that. Open the window. Look outside. <laughs> it's like Christmas morning with Scrooge. Yeah, exactly. You there, boy. What day is it? Fuck you. Oh, solstice. All right. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> he said, what is it? Go and get me a goose. He didn't say, what is it? Oh, I'll run to the butcher and get a goose. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I might get up with the sunrise or I might be asleep you until send late. me pictures. Well, speaking of rising with the sun and then immediately closing the window going, fuck that. I think it's time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Mm-hmm. Yes, certainly. We must say this firstly. Thank you to Sans Foster. To Natalie Heverin. And to, possibly my favourite name so far. Okay. Majestic Goose. <laughs> <laughs> Majestic Goose? Majestic Goose. That is, that That trumps the fancy duck. Uh, it very much does. Oh my God. Does the I fancy know. duck go to the Majestic Goose for guidance? Sir, please, I pay my penance for the week. Let my <laughs> children <laughs> live. <laughs> My my brother came to stay with me this weekend, and we were he was on the PlayStation looking for a game to play. And there's a there's a game I can't remember what it's called, but there's a game you can get, and basically you play a goose, <laughs> and the aim of the game <laughs> is to fuck up other people as a goose. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Which is just brilliant. And you just wander around as a goose, honking at people, stealing people's shit. That feels very cathartic. Getting in the way. It looked, it looked brilliant. Oh, that is a good game. You need to play that <laughs> later. I, think I might have to get that one. I like a goose. They're, they're good fun. They're vicious. But, you know, you can punch them in the face. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, no one's going to stop you. Yeah. The goose will. <laughs> the goose will fight back. That's the challenge you take with the goose. With the majestic goose, particularly. Majestic goose. Yes. We had fun on Patreon this week. We told of how arguments about wine can really get out of hand with some student riots 
Oh yeah, yeah, yep. that was it. <laughs> you had <laughs> lost like, it completely. I was hadn't like, you? wine. Was, was there was the wine? What's going on with the wine? <laughs> Students, yes, Students. that was it. <laughs> yes, it was a town and gown rivalry back in the medieval times at Oxford University. It was packed with facts. Who'd have thought such a thing would happen? And lots of talk of saints as well. Fun facts about saints. Who doesn't I... love a saint? Who doesn't? Well, you know the atheists. If you want to know what the hell we're talking about, please consider joining us on patreon.com forward slash the poisonous cabinet. This is our subscription service where you can support support the show and in return for your generous donations we will give you extra content every single week so five dollars a month you get an extra episode the deadly nightcaps as well as lots of other bonus material and the cyanide connoisseurs also get a gift pack from us and they get weekly behind the scenes little audio excerpts and they get a monthly episode the case files of pc morris and our undying love but then all patrons get our undying love well nick are you ready (laughs) no no (laughs) no to drink cocktails and talk about poison (laughs) probably or we could end it all. Yes. <laughs> Drink poison. That might be, this might be the week. Talk about cocktails. <laughs> okay, let's do one of those. What, one of those? One of, well, we could see what happens. See what happens. Hooray, hooray, hooray. <laughs> it is Nick's story this week, but we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell. And what flavor? Our cocktail of the week. Nick. Yes. Your story, your pick? Yes. So this week's secret ingredient is... Is the island of Curaçao. Oh my god! And I think that's how it's pronounced. The entire island? The entire island. Ooh, lovely. It's a very beautiful island. It lo- looks lovely. I, I looked at pictures up. and it was like, ooh, that's it is. nice. It is. in the Caribbean. Yes. Should we go? I, th- I didn't realise it was the Caribbean. I didn't either. I thought it was sort of out, a sort of Asia-y sort of way. <laughs> The way you said that, I thought it was east. I, I, I did. I thought I thought it was sort of that, in that direction. Com- entirely, completely wrong. <laughs> I mean, well, Curacao is the bitter orange fruit. Am I right? Yes, it is the liqueur made on the island of orange peel. Aha! I don't actually know. I'm going to I'm gonna have to look this up. Yeah. As to why it became blue. Yes, because most of us would know blue Curacao is yeah. the thing that makes... The drinks blue. So a couple of people, when they were guessing the cocktail, said, are we going to have a fishbowl? That's where you would get the blue from if you weren't drinking blue WKD. Yeah, mostly in those tiki cocktails or those crazy cocktails you get that are blue, it's because there's blue curacao in it. And curacao, you can, if you have blue curacao, it's got more additives in it, but you can make a margarita with that. Oh, you know, gotcha, because absolutely. it's like a triple sec. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually just googling why it is blue. Do have um, mm, well, I I'm going to wager while you're okay. looking that it is based on the color of the water. Well, I was thinking that very thing because it's stunningly turquoise water around there. But you can also you can get red curacao as well. Can you? You can. There's a there's a red curacao. <gasps> um, I want can, that. You can buy. Oh, I want that. Oh, we should order some. One of every color. Apparently, it came, it came about in the 20s. I'm saying this is from Curacao.com. Yeah, because it evokes a tropical location. Well, I guess. When they wanted something in the 20s, a bit fancy in their cocktails. And as you say, lovely blue beaches and blue seas. Not blue beaches. Blue seas. <laughs> the famous blue beaches of the weird. time. They yeah. were like, we've got this wrong. Okay. Blue, blue seas. So blue seas. we're in blue. Well, so we with go. the island of Curacao, because there yes. could be no ingredient that comes from that. Yes, what could there possibly be? <laughs> well, I'm intrigued how you've gone with this. So... Okay. What have you come up with? I have gone with. Huh? We're having huh? an old flame. An old flame? Yes. You've not invited my exes around, have you? No. Oh, good. Thankfully. Okay, I don't know what that could be, no. but it sounds exciting. The world of possibilities. Indeed there is. I think it is high time for us to skip into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a minute. And we're back. Hello. Well, Nick, the old flame. The old flame. Now, it looks flamey coloured. It does look flamey coloured. But it doesn't look blue. It's not blue. It's not the blue of the flame. It's not the blue. It is the burning, burning brightness of the flame. I'm kind of disappointed it's not blue. Oh, I'm sorry. We can put some blue in it later. Uh, do, you to, do you want me to put blue in it? Uh, maybe in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of just I, I think blue. I think blue, but I think blue and orange would not... Yeah, it's an orange colour. It will make it go brown. I don't know. I have high hopes for my chemistry okay. and my mixing ability. Your, your colour mixing palette. But I'll suffer through it now. But Most it's colors. very orange, so it looks very pretty. Yep. It smells fruity. It's nice. It's it's got anything's gonna be better than last week. This is true. Last we week we was can't, a... we, we've got yeah, we can't go much wrong. Well let's dive in. Okay. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, hello. Ooh. Ooh, okay. 
No, that, that better than last week. Immediately better than last week. Well, that was an instant ooh from both of us. Yes. It was very, spir- <laughs> well, very spirit forward, weirdly. Yeah. Ooh, okay, here we go. Here's the flavours. It's bitter. Mm. There's a bitter aftertaste. Oh, okay. That's interesting. It's interesting. It's curious. It's not bad. It's not bad. I don't know what it is, though. No. No, yeah, it's, that, it's, no, no, no. it's good. It's okay. So, yeah, very sudden hit of alcohol. And then there's a bitterness afterwards, so not overly sweet. Yeah, really sour front taste. Front taste. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me the bullshit I make up oh, every time impressive. I'm it's trying to impressive. sound knowledgeable about cocktails after four years. It's very bitter aftertaste, though, mm. which is verging on too much, but it's oh, not quite. Okay. Yeah, but you, you have a mouth yeah, I mean, made of... Bitterness. <laughs> knives. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's try and work this out. So give me some ideas. Is it Curacao, yeah? Yeah, surprisingly. Oh my god. Oh my god. Now Curacao is more bitter than Triple Sec, or is it It's actually it's actually exactly the same. Is it really? Triple Sec is a brand name. What? Yeah. I didn't realise that either. Well Triple Sec because you get it from And the, the Quattro Quantro and things like that. They're, they're, yeah. they're brand names. Are they all Curacao? Yeah, Curacao is, yeah. Curacao, oh Triple Sec, Quantro, it's all the same thing. Oh, well, sorry. I <laughs> built that up massively. Now I can tell there's some bit of Curacao in here. Oh, actually, I've just been saying the same bloody thing it's each the same. week. I mean, obviously, every every, every, every manufacturer has we'll their own tweak. tweak on it, their own particular combination mm. of things. But basically, it's all it's all based on a orange peel. Yes. A sort of a distilled orange peel to get that orange flavour. But yeah, some well, people add different things. Some yeah. people add more sugar. So Cointreau is generally a quite sweet. Quite sweet. Whereas your normal sort of like a, a Curacao is is not, is perhaps not. So yeah, they, having, are, they do all differ, but that's as much as gins differ in their sort of True, in fair, their flavors. fair play, fair play. Yeah, because I've, I've tried Curacao, I taste a bit of the blue Curacao, and I've tried white Curacao, mm. And have definitely felt it was bit more bitter than triple sec. Mm. And but then I've had two different triple secs, and they are worlds apart. Exactly. So I'm, I'm definitely tasting the bit. It's almost like the orange peel. Do you put orange peel in this? No. Fine. Orange juice. There is orange juice. There's orange juice. It's really fronty. Fronty is the it's only fronty. word I can describe it. Another spirit. Yeah, a few more. A few more. What have you done, sir? Is it gin? There is gin. So gin. Okay. So that's quite strong. Gin, curacao, something twiggy. Uh, it's not quite twiggy. It's not quite I herbally. Say twiggy. It's fruity, mm. leafy, mm. flowery, <laughs> bricky. Brick, I don't yes, want. Brick, let's go with the bricky. Bricky. It's got a taste of mortar about it. <laughs> I, don't, I hate it when you do it's this. It's got the taste get... of kiln. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the sort of the day. <laughs> just when I say herbally, no, uh, and then I'm going to say something fucking. It's not what, quite not, twiggy. It's, it's not. It's not. It's not your twiggy. Okay, it's not like chartreuse or benedictine, or no. it's not that sort of herbally thing. Something in the chinor. No. Would I be I mean, you, vegetably? You're, you're, you're in the you're in the ballpark. Vegetably, ish. ish. Savory, savory. Think red. Red vermouth. There is red vermouth. Oh, okay. Is there any other red in this? I think more red. Think more red. Cassis. Campari? Campari. Be- oh, oh, Campari. Oh, shit. Think, Sorry, think you did bit- say earlier that you run out of Campari. Bitter and red. <laughs> oh, that's... Oh, fair. Fair. What is Campari? You know what? I don't actually know what's off my I head. I don't think we've ever, <laughs> don't think we've ever thought, thought of that. that Have we ever it's discussed it? a selection it? of herbs and herbs and spices and things. So it was a KFC. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's an, if- yeah, an infusion of herbs. <laughs> Why did you say it like that? An infusion of an herbs. It, it's like you're a waiter. An infusion of herbs. <laughs> herbs. An infusion of a, what? Because I'm Italian now. That wasn't Italian. I think you find it was. <laughs> every, every Italian listens to a podcast going, well, unsubscribe right now. <laughs> infusion of herbs. It sounded, like, it sounded um, like the weird waiter from Meaning of Life. <laughs> well, it's in herbs. It's, it's by infusion of herbs. Right, okay, so. <laughs> bitter, bitter herbs. Fucking, fucking Curacao. Gin, red vermouth, Campari, orange juice. That's your lot. That's it? That's it. Sugar? No. No? Oh, needed it. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Right, I'm going to be a little devil. Can I put the blue shit in here? Yeah. And I'm going to take a picture. Where's the blue shit? I did look, but we have done an awful lot of blue cocktails. We actually have. 
because I, I don't just try to find any old cocktail. I try to find one that I think might be vaguely tasty. You do, yeah. You go with the um, classics, and that's so, what makes the show so good. So there are plenty of blue cocktails, which is like blue curacao and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> I drink that. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put some of this in here. Oh, this is gonna go horrible. What am I doing? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I just had a midlife crisis. There, like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> You're just right. free I just pouring. Want to put a little bit. Blue stuff in into oh, no, a glass. Oh, that's cool. Look, it's kind of gone greeny. Well, you've got, you've got a sunk. layered thing going I've on. I've got a layered thing. I made something. You made a thing. Now you got to name it. Name it. Name it. Name it. Old flame who rejected me. I don't know what. The blue flame. <laughs> The blue flame. The blue flame. Like it. There you are. Like okay. it. So it looks, it looks cute, but I don't... Okay, well, without stirring it. It's going to be exactly the same as it was before. Ah, it's the same. <laughs> I'm going to stir it. And like... Oh, and uh, now it's gone really brown, like you said. <laughs> yeah, because orange and blue is going to go brown, Look, I feel. just... I didn't listen in whatever class it was that we learned about colours. <laughs> when do you learn about colours? Like Science, primary colours? art... Science art. <laughs> science, what, science of like colours, oh, art no, no. of mixing stuff. No, no, that has gone olive green. That's not a good look. I can understand why they don't put this in. Mm, I'm getting more orange. You're getting more orange? <laughs> it's actually quite nice, actually. It's not much different, but that might be... Well, I imagine it's just more sugar. So it's probably sweeter, so it's counteracting yeah. the bitterness. I need more sugar. I apparently am not hyperactive enough. No, indeed. It's really weird. I've taken pictures, people. It's like an it's literally an olive green. You know what this Oh my god. What? Sorry, genius moment here. Okay, the yeah. colour of this, people, looks like a really high end type of green juice, like like a pressed green juice, <laughs> like your celery and your cucumber. You put this shit in a see through equivalent of a Stanley Cup. Walk around on your morning walk like, yeah, I got my green juice. You're just getting hammered and no one knows. Do that. <laughs> what this has done is unlocked the creative part oh, of my brain. <laughs> I'm unlocked gonna... the genius Sinead. Absolutely. Oh, a million dollar <laughs> ideas are flowing. I'm going to make us millionaires by the end of this episode. Excellent. On that note, <laughs> with the old flame firmly in hand and yeah. my notepad in the other... <laughs> It's a different story. I'll, I'll give it a go. Let's give it a go. <laughs> Let's give it a go and see what happens. So, yes, we're going to start <gasps> this week. We have the interesting, incredible story of the fantastically named Gregor McGregor of Clan McGregor. Okay, yay! <laughs> That's the most Scottish man who's ever lived. That is the most Scottish man who's ever lived. <laughs> what do we call our son of Clan McGregor? Gregor. Well, it is one of the big clans. <laughs> oh, it is it? indeed. Yeah, yeah, it is one of the big clans. You'd want yeah. everyone to know. Yeah. You know, so, there's always people from not from Scotland, not from Ireland. There are the big families. There are the big names. Yeah, absolutely. So the clan this McGregor is, is one of is one of the big ones. Absolutely. But you would want to go like McGregor of Gregor of Gregor of Greg. Yeah. <laughs> so, Gregors. So, so Gregor was born on the 24th of December, 1786. Oh, nice. Now this family nice. has, as you say, has, has has a big history behind it. Mm -hmm. His father is Daniel McGregor. Daniel McGregor. Now, he is a ship's captain in the East India Company. No. So, a military fish. man, military man. His grandfather, who earned the nickname Gregor the Beautiful, <laughs> was an officer in a, the regiment that would eventually become known as the Black Watch. That's, so, yeah. that's a nice nickname, though. Like, and, I, and I admire that in a dream. Going, yeah. You know what? He's the finest looking he, man he, I've ever he's seen. A, he's a fine looking chap. He's a fine looking chap. The beautiful. Gregor the beautiful. <laughs> All these other guys preening and doing their hair and skin regime like, oh, I'll be beautiful one day. <laughs> I'm going off completely random, random tangent. Okay. Dracula. Right, very random. Very but yes, random. I am familiar Dracula, with his work. Vlad. Dear old Vlad the Imperial. Dear, dear old Vlad. His son was known as Vlad the Handsome. He was known as Vlad the Handsome. <laughs> just, just bring away. Is that is that a compliment or an insult to well, to, to be a compliment? As, mm, it's the son of a warrior and the well, member of a of a noble warmongering fighting proud family. Beautiful is a lovely word, but handsome is in kind of like, well, you've got your looks going for you. Oh, that, no, that's a, fair point. That, that's, that's a fair point. But I think in the McGregor case, it was very much meant as a compliment. Yeah, beautiful is um, also like sort of beautiful, know, yes. amazing and kind yep. of like awestruck. Uh, but it also, handsome is like, well, you've your looks. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, with his pedigree of militariness, mm. it's no surprise that when Gregor turns 16, he follows the family traditions and he enlists in the British Army. Now, this is just as the Napoleonic... Wars are beginning to start in Europe. They are big wars. They are big wars, indeed. And he joins the 57th Foot Regiment. 
<laughs> Bloody hell, <laughs> mate. Oh, don't. But his family, being quite well known, obviously, and having a bit of money behind them, they purchase a commission for him. So he's not just going to be an enlisted soldier. <laughs> he goes in as an ensign. An ensign? An ensign. What's that? Which is the sort, of, sort of the lowest of the commissioned ranks. Oh, right, because we've never get. heard of it. That's yeah. why. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so it's, it's, but he's still an officer. Ooh, he's, he's an officer. He's, mm, but he's mm, gone in there mm. because of his family's money. Now... That would have set his family back in today's equivalent of about twenty thousand pounds. Well, I can well imagine. To, yeah. to, he's got this bit of a head start. To begin with, he's stationed in Ashford. Well, Ashford Kent. Ashford, Ashford Kent. Oh yes. <laughs> uh, oh, why? <laughs> well, b- because at the time England is terrified of an invasion from France. So it's a strategic issue. So they site? are sort of building up sort of fortresses and castles and oh, sure yeah, they and are, defenses actually, yeah. against on the southeast coast. So this against... is an area that we know. By yeah. the way, it's like down the road. <laughs> I went to school there. <laughs> so yeah, so they're building up their defenses against the possible French invasion. Ah. So he is there, yeah, as part of this force who is building up these yeah these fortifications. Nice within a year of his arrival in Ashford he has been promoted to lieutenant now this sort of progression would ordinarily take sort of three years isn't it lieutenant one that was one naval and one's army or something or one's American oh I don't know one's American I think lieutenant is American is that a, is that American so should I be saying lieutenant I think it's lieutenant but, please, but, but as you said naval army not sure of the difference there but I think it's lieutenant in lieutenant. English okay. I remember some army people yelling at me once okay so he's reposted to that rank <laughs> he is promoted to the next rank up to the L rank <laughs> <laughs> but this is done off his, entirely off his own back there's no family money involved in this so to do what would good normally for, yeah, take yeah. like three years to do it in a year mm. he, he must have been damn good yeah. he must have been good at good his for soldiering him. Good for him. And, and worked incredibly hard so hurrah for him uh-huh. now at some point after his arrival in Ashford Gregor makes the acquaintance of Maria Bowater Maria is the daughter of an admiral <laughs> so yeah, so, so quite fancy, and she's likely been introduced to McGregor as a sort of up and coming officer in the king's army, sort of thing. So this is this is what to look out for. He thought he's all made lieutenant in a year type of thing, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but they seem to hit it off, and they hit it off, and yeah. they end up married. I like that. I have recently been catching up with the second series of Bridgerton. This all makes perfect it's sense exactly to me. Exactly how it works. It's a fine, fine match. <laughs> it's a fine match indeed. <laughs> yeah, daughter of an admiral, oh up my god, officer in the army. I mean, what more? Could Society you... will be a witter. And they were indeed, indeed. Yeah. Now, say so Maria arrives at to the marriage with a substantial dowry <laughs> we behind love her. Love a dowry. So yeah, she's got a big pile of cash behind her and literally it, behind her literally behind <laughs> she's her. She's, dragging she's it she's dragging it in, in a little cart she's got full of full of, full of gold um, and not long after the wedding her father the admiral passes away he dies and leaves her with yet another inheritance so she is absolutely minted oh, she it. is loaded he is obviously delighted mm-hmm. with his wife's mm-hmm. fortune he's not come from a poor family by any means but this is another level yes sort this of is of, millionaire of riches yeah this is a whole another level of fancy in 1805 they set up home in london and gregor thinking that he needs to up his social status really to to really to match his wife because mm-hmm. she's from a quite a well-known family she's obviously got a lot of money behind her so she he uses her money to buy himself a captaincy. Okay. So he bought his ensignery. He earned his... He's earned his, his lieutenant, lieutenant And then he decides to, right, I'm going to buy myself up to the next rank. Okay. That would ordinarily... Everyone did it. People take about did it. nine years. If you just did it through hard graft, it's like a good 10, nine, 10 years of work to get that promotion. Mm. But he goes, here you go. Here's 900 pounds, which is about 40,000 wow. pounds today. Yeah. So a huge amount of money to Oof. get him up to that next level. So commissions basically cheat codes. Pretty absolutely, yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, mm-hmm. it earns the the army money. They they they're getting no, the money. Only to have it and has no <laughs> repercussions whatsoever. Mm. If this podcast has taught us nothing, <laughs> Thomas Wayne, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so being a captain is so much better when you're swanning around town with your wife's money having a grand old time at the end of 1805 the 57th foot who have been based in ashford are sent off to do gibraltar nice and now so you see the the war in europe mm-hmm. is currently centered in spain portugal being england's allies yes. spain and france time together so the, yeah, the spanish peninsula is all in on fire mainly <laughs> And sort of Gibraltar is the sort of the this British rock. hub <laughs> yeah. um, of all the activity for, for 
Britain is. So it's a British rule at the moment. Yes, yeah, so Gibraltar yeah, yeah. is under British control. Okay. And it, yeah, it is the hub for all the activity mm-hmm. going on on the Spanish peninsula. And it's there that he sort of gets increasingly obsessed with rank and position mm-hmm. and all the sort of all the glitter that comes along with those things. I guess. So, well, if he's got a fancy wife, she's probably whispering in his ear. You know, I'm not saying it's a wife fault or anything like that, but if, you, if you're introduced to the high society, mm. then you'd be going, well, actually, rank and status is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is the outwards. And he also said he loves the outward signs of those things as well. Mm. So he loves the, the medals and the sashes and the, the adornments that come with having those higher ranks. They're called accessories, Nick, Accessories. And we love them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would be obsessed too. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So he's, he's really loving all the, all the bling that, that he gets <laughs> as, a, as, an, as an army officer. Who wouldn't? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, unfortunately, the people below him in his, in his, in his regiment really don't enjoy it because he insists now that anyone under his command, they cannot leave their quarters in anything less than full dress uniform you can't even go to the shops unless you are tired who's going to the shops like you're going to meet the king type of thing so you have to look your he wants his regiment regiment to be reflective has to be absolutely immaculate interesting at all times no matter what it's an interesting concept i'm not going to shoot it out of the air immediately (laughs) not that i would make any difference but yeah but also status mm. you know starting around whatever you think about where you are but yeah it's status it's showing that no, i am of the finery and yeah. you will respect me and it instills and, in respect and, and what his men do reflect upon him absolutely what his subordinates yeah. do so yeah if they are immaculately turned out ironed mm. yeah big boots, thing boots shine buckles polished and they go oh they're commanding officer he must be a man of yeah. status to insist upon such standards exactly it's first glance things. so yeah absolutely. first impressions make yeah, everything but, back then it doesn't particularly endear him to his men Aww. who spend most of the time polishing boots <laughs> um, but they fancy and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and scrubbing things but he's having a grand old time he's you know, either he's either like really fabulous or he's like the crypto king guy who just is wearing gold and he's got a grill and is sitting there <laughs> just like with branded everything you're like oh you twat yeah he can get a new uniform he, he's he's gone on some campaign he can get new medal that medal's going on quick Ooh. as soon as he can so yeah he's he's loving the the, the the accessories in 1809 his regiment is sent from gibraltar actually into portugal as reinforcements for the army mm. so until then they've been of an administrative sort of regiment sort of unloading ships loading ships polishing, but not polishing buckles but not actually <laughs> fighting no, yeah, um, that's why they had so much time but, but now they're, they're being sent into portugal they're now mm. under the command of the duke of wellington okay so they're there they're there to fight Ooh. and fights he does and he fights well and he fights against the spanish and he obtains the rank of major so he is quite swiftly going up the ranks no. he's a skilled sort of tactician and he's, military man he's so, proven that he's bought his way in but also he's capable he's capable and um, he's earned some of his promotion as well so yeah, he, yeah if absolutely. you were a gamer then if you can get the cheat code it's fine but you know you could have done all of that yeah as long as you can do the boss battle it's fine yeah indeed <laughs> eventually though he decides no this is enough. I've had enough now of the military life, and he decides what? to retire. He's, he decides to retire from the army. His wife's back in London, and he's thinking, oh, "She's got a load of money. I have now, I have now earned enough of a reputation, and I'm now of enough a higher rank. If I go back to London now, Ooh, toast of the town. Exactly. I'm going to be the toast of the town. I'm, I'm there." With my wife's connections, I can get in anywhere I bloody want to. I mean, you would. So, yeah. So, yeah. he does. <laughs> and, he, and he has already shown he fancy. He fancy. He, he fancy. He loves a fancy frock. He loves oh, a fancy it, outfit. Mate. He's got more medals than anyone can count now. So, <laughs> so. I'm, I'm so on his side. I'd so, be yeah. like, he's worked hard. He's worked yeah, he hard. Has he has worked earned hard. that right. Do he's you? earned that right. So, he decides, yeah, yeah no, enough of this, enough <laughs> this military life. His regiment are like, please, someone else let us fight. We've done nothing but polish buckles <laughs> so for 20 years. That's all we've done. <laughs> but yeah, so this is, what, what time span are we sort of like, so from when he went out to Gibraltar, it's a, what, a couple of years? So yeah, so? we're probably looking, so about three or four years. Nice, or okay. So, so you can um, go back, oh, okay, I'm excited, I'm really excited yeah. for him. And exactly, he, he yeah. can claim he's been in Portugal, he's fought he the Spanish, he's he's a, he's an experienced battlefield commander yeah. and all and this sort of stuff. And he's a McGregor. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so he gets back to London, huh. it doesn't entirely go 
he he's not getting into the rooms he wants to get into. Yes, he's sort of he's getting into the sort of like the, the sort of the middle levels of society. Mm. But there's there's some places that he wants to get that, that he's being snubbed from really because he's not Ooh. quite reached that level yet. So he decides, fuck this off. I'm not having this. And how dare you? He decides he moves everything to Edinburgh. Fair. He goes fair. back up to Edinburgh. is very nice. Well, in London, he's a sort of quite a relatively small fish in a big pond in London. Yes, there's a lot uh, of movers he, and shakers at the time. He's a, he's a major. He's not a general. Mm. He's not a lord. He's not a sir. He's not any of this. He's another He's He's another guy. military man in a city of military men. But in Edinburgh. Um, but in Edinburgh. <gasps> exactly. In Edinburgh. And also, he's a McGregor in Edinburgh. Yeah. So he's going to be toast of the town, Ooh, he thinks. Yeah. He's going to be it. absolutely up there. He gets to Edinburgh. He settles in. People in Edinburgh go, fuck off. <laughs> oh! <laughs> they, they are not interested in the slightest. <laughs> by, his, by this point, he, he calls himself Sir Gregor McGregor. Is his, no. Uh, he introduces himself as. Um, <laughs> even he ups himself to Colonel. Sort of, he, he, How? Was, he, was a, he was a major. Well, he gets there. He thinks, well, no one's going to check. Oh no! So he has notions. Now. So he okay, has, so he he has, has notions, right? desperate notions. <laughs> because so, I was, I was sort of on the the idea that you know, if he'd worked hard, he could go up there and people would be like, "Oh, we're really proud, proud mm-hmm. of our son." You know, kind of, he's coming back. Is he a bit of a notiony? He's, he's not getting the respect uh, that he thinks he deserves. He's demanding he's, respect. Yeah, he's thinking. He's thinking I should be in much grander ballrooms than this. Oh, that's not going to um, work. <laughs> yeah. So he say he he ups his rank to colonel. Say so, yeah, no one's going to. Right to the war office to ask. Also, you know, <laughs> sorry, people are people are not stupid as well. <laughs> You're up there as in kind of like major. No, I'm colonel now. Oh, that happened overnight, did it? Yeah, mm-hmm. this is, yeah. Mm-hmm. He yeah. he also starts going around proclaiming that he's a member of the Portuguese Knightly Order of Christ. Who cares? So he's there. So where, he says when he was sort of seconded into the Portuguese army, right. he was given this sort of knightly order. So he's or, a knight. Now. So yeah. So he that where's where he gets the sir from. The sir. So yes, because he's a member of these Portuguese <laughs> knightly order. Nobody um, would give a shit. He goes. He goes around riding in a, in a brightly coloured carriage. Love he it. gets his carriage painted bright green with colour of this Portuguese <laughs> um, sort of knightly order. So everyone around town knows it's him a coming. He also claims that he has inherited the chieftainship of Clan McGregor. He hasn't. Went no. to a different branch of the family. So, 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 so a lot oh, of people there do going, Don't do that. Yeah, a lot of people there are going. No, no, I know, I know, I know the real well, one. No. <laughs> you're I know in, him. He's over here. Yeah, you're in Scotland, mate. We know. <laughs> we, we all know who the real ones. everybody is. Yeah. Oh, I don't so, know how to feel about this. And one hand, bling, love it, love it. Yeah. Ride around in the big coloured carriage. Look at me, bitches. <laughs> you know, I'm fancy. It's like fine, fair play, mm. slay. But <laughs> if you're gonna come in and say, well, I was made a knight and I've decided now I'm colonel, yeah. and also I'm now the head of the clan McGregor, yeah. everyone's gonna try and go. Ooh, Ooh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Big full at 180 there going, can't throw that word around, mate. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he, he starts sort of claiming kinship with any duke or lord that he can think, oh, yes, I'm related to that person and this person and that person. And <sighs> You're not really showing allegiance, though, are yeah. you? Because you're kind of going, you know, I'm one of the heads of the families of Scotland, also Portugal. And I know, like, the conflict. Well, the conflict has still been raging between mm-hmm. Scotland and England. It's going to build, but it's 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 had its time. Yeah, you're you're sort of all over the place. So mate. yeah, exactly. So <laughs> fabulous carriage, f- but a fabulous carriage and fabulous medals <laughs> and a fabulous hat. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's all I want. <laughs> I will follow you into the fires of hell, sir. <laughs> and if only he were happy to settle with that. But but he's <laughs> with not. me following him, going yay. <laughs> but he decides, okay, Scotland, fine, Scotland. I'm not. It's not the place for me. Fuck you. <laughs> so, so he returns to London, thinking, okay, fine. Perhaps, perhaps London is the place. To be. Is it uh, though? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, the, the Scot, the Scottish, they're not taking any of his shit. Whereas the English are going, Famously. oh, it's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why did you think going to Scotland would be a good idea? <laughs> Another interesting thing that happens in, in 1811, his old regiment, the 57th, who are still fighting in Portugal, Aye. they fight at this big battle called the Battle of Olbera, and they, during this battle or after this battle, they are hailed for their bravery. Okay. And their daring do during this engagement. And it earns the regiment a huge amount of renown and respect. And also the nickname the Diehards. 
Nice. This regiment. Now, supposedly... Led by John McLean. <laughs> supposedly during the battle, a chap called William Inglis, he is carrying the colours, the banner of the regiment. And he's there, there are French on all sides, and he's there carrying the banner. His arm gets shot away by a cannon. <gasps> But he's still there. No, he's holding the banner. How? And he's well, with, with, one, with one arm. He's holding the banner. And he's sort of encouraging his his colleagues and his, yeah, his the other troops around him. And he's shouting out, Die hard, 57th. Die hard. Ooh. Sort of make them pay for all the... For their, for their their advances Aye. yeah so he's there and it becomes incredibly famous and they they become renowned as this incredibly tough mm. grizzled unit and it was immortalised um, in a film and it was immortalised in a film I mean we need to look that up afterwards <laughs> because wh- where the fuck did the name Die Hard come from well this regiment Known is, as the no. nickname of the die. Well, I don't know if the film came from that, but this is, yeah, and it's all over the press. Everyone is going the diehards. They're fucking amazing. Woo-hoo. The heroism of the fifty seventh. Now, of course, Gregor is m- massively dining out on this mm. because he was a major of the fifty seventh. Now, no matter he retired a year before this engagement happened, <laughs> yeah. but he is still there. Going, oh, I'm, so, I'm one of the, the diehards. I was there, my boys, yeah. type thing. And so, yeah, he's really dining out on this. Uh-huh. Then things start to go wrong. <laughs> They've been going so well. They've been going so well. I mean, he's been living out on this for quite some time. Okay. Um, and and so he's been not as fast as he wanted, but he's been progressing. It's been His okay. wife's money has helped grease some yeah. wheels. His reputation, this new Die Hard thing, that's great. <laughs> There's this film all about me. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of 1811, his wife, Maria, dies. Shit. She dies. Gregor has now lost his main source of income. Because her mm. inheritances and her... And not go to him. Well, no, because it's, it's, it's formed in some sort of trust that she gets an income from the, like, the family oh, type thing. Oh, she's a girl. Because so she, she's a girl. And all this. So, it, yeah, it's not automatically coming to him. So mm. she's sort of been living off sort of like an endowment type thing, which he has had ready access to. But now she's gone. All of that has, has stopped. All of that influence, really, that came from his wife mm. has, is, is fading away, really. Oh, dear. So he's going, ah, crap what what the hell do i <laughs> what the hell do i do now also boo who my wife oh no i mean yeah i mean he's still trying to get in places but no one cares about sort of titles and medals and stuff you haven't got the cash to back it up indeed no one is no one is giving two pence really about any of it marrying again is mm, well marrying too soon yeah, is not yeah. going to help his cause bit, is, bit is yeah is going to cause a bit of a scandal a bit of a nick returning to scotland is like he's been booed out of edinburgh yes his father is well off he's got some decent lands but does he want to be like a like a tenant farmer in scotland not really no he does he wants to live the high life so what the hell is he going to do Mm. i mean he thinks the only real place that he's ever had any success is is the military yeah but so going back to the british army he sort of he thinks he's burnt a few too many bridges on his way up Mm. to to make a success of it there so what the hell then he strikes upon an idea. The war in Spain has sort of spread discontent to their colonies okay. around the world, and especially in South America. And in July 1811, Venezuela had declared independence oh, okay. from, from Spain. Now, there were still huge battles going on in Venezuela between royalists and revolutionary mm, forces mm. and things, and the, the issue wasn't settled for another sort of 40 years or so. Revolutionary Venezuela has dispatched sort of envoys to Europe to try and yeah, gather support for their fight against the Spanish. Now, they think in Great Britain, who are also fighting the Spanish, right. they'll be going, absolutely, here, have cash, have guns, <laughs> have boats, <laughs> and all this sort of stuff. And they do to an extent, but also mm. Great Britain is going, they want to give colonies too many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so, but also, they're fighting the Spanish, and we're fighting the Spanish. So it's like, mm-hmm. uh, Maybe. So their, their invoices are generally sort of paraded around town and given a great deal of respect and sort of pomp and yeah. circumstance without really getting too much mm. out of it. But McGregor happens to meet one of these envoys, mm. a chap called General Francisco de Miranda. Nice. Now, he has been in London and he travels around Europe for a number of years drumming up support. McGregor thinks, ooh, ooh, ooh. ooh. Oh, he he sees the respect that this general mm. is held in sort of London society. He's a general. As this, he's a, but he's a general, but also he's there. He's fighting the fight against the dastardly Spanish. He's fighting the yeah. revolutionary against the the enemies of the English at the time. Mm. So he's, so McGregor's there thinking, oh, if I get some of that, 
if I get this reputation of fighting against the Spanish, fighting against oppression, all this sort of stuff, yeah. and I get this, then perhaps when I get back, there'll be the, money, and there'll people. be money and celebrity, and people will go, "Oh, look, you're wonderful." <laughs> yeah, have a fancy ballroom and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> sure. So okay. Yeah, so he decides, I'm going to go to South America. Do it. I'm going to go to Venezuela. He sells the small little holding he has in Scotland. Mm-hmm. That he inherits. He sells that, mm. and he sets sail for South America. Da, da, da. McGregor's on a boat. Uh-huh. He arrives in Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, yeah, in sort of April 1812. It's about a fortnight after much of the city has been destroyed by an earthquake. Oh right! Yes. Oh yeah! <laughs> there was a massive earthquake. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's so. It's not a great time for the revolutionary forces, really. <laughs> Everyone goes, we have nothing. <laughs> we, they have nothing. Royalist forces are sort oh, of approaching God. from all directions. The revolutionary government is losing support quite fast, really. Yeah. Um, and it's starting to collapse. But no need, no need to fret. Sort of McGregor is here. Don't worry, everybody. Don't worry. I'm here, everyone. It's fine. Um, he does drop the Scottish Lord thing, thinking that nice. Republican rebels may not be too keen on lords <laughs> but he, keep, he keeps the sir thinking portuguese knight i can i can go with that so he keeps the sir sir gregor mcgregor thing going on and he offers his services directly to general miranda in caracas general's delighted absolutely okay. british army officer and from the famous diehards no less yes indeed absolutely i mean god yeah absolutely oh my god we love that film he is immediately given command of a caval- cavalry battalion um, and given the rank of colonel. Off you go, mate. Do what you like. Here's a load of soldiers, a load of cavalry. Oh, good Crack lord. Crack on. Okay, fair enough. In his first battle against royalists, he wins a decisive victory and his reputation is sort of cemented, really. He is, nice. he is a saviour. <gasps> he is just the sort of person these revolutionary forces need. He's arrived just in time. Hurrah. He swiftly climbs through the ranks, and not just in the military, but in sort of society as well. His successes in battle and his increasingly sort of flamboyant nature mm. are held in wonder at the capital, really. He can now sort of barely walk with the amount of medals he's got <laughs> dropping off him, sort of thing. Um, <laughs> there is, so, there is the bling, so bling. much bling going on. Everyone is in Crackers is fascinated by this sort of quite eccentric Scottish officer no surprise. <laughs> who's, who's going around the place. He becomes Commandant General of Cavalry, then General of the Brigade, mm-hmm. and then finally General of Division. Ah. which is pretty much the top tier. He's under sort of Simon Bolivar, or Simon oh, Bolivar, as yeah. sort of commander in forces of the Venezuelan sort of independence Ooh, group. So he's really up there. And sort of each promotion comes with a bigger and bigger hat. So I'm thinking, so he's having a lo- and a bigger and bigger badge and more and more medals. So he's, <laughs> he's delightful. He's having a fantastic time. And at the height of his fame, he marries for a second time. Donna Josefa, Antonia Andrea Augustina de Louvre. Lovely. Yes. Now, she is the cousin of Simon Bolivar. Mm. Okay, fancy. Um, and heiress to an incredibly important and wealthy yeah. Caracas family. So, again, right up there in levels of society. In the coming months, his life is full of glorious battles and fancy parties. He doesn't always win <laughs> his, his battles, but he manages to twist his defeats into sort of heroic escapes. Yes. And and feats of incredibly daring do. Yeah. And things. And everyone is absolutely in love with him. He's, <laughs> he's incredible. One point, though, royalist forces are surrounding Caracas. Mm-hmm. His wife and many of the senior revolutionaries in Caracas are forced to flee the city. And they board a ship, the Sapphire, um, and they set sail for the Dutch island of Curaçao. Yay! Yay! Is that uh, the only reference? That's the only reference. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> but it's a really good one. It's a very uh, good. <laughs> but they, yeah, they, they set sail for Curaçao and they sort of encamp there for the best part of a year. Mm. Also, where they are trying to rebuild their position, rebuild their forces. No one from Spain is going to attack Curaçao. It's mm. under the protection of the Dutch, who are incredibly powerful at this time. So, yeah, they just leave them leave them be to sort of, yeah, rekindle the sort of the revolution. The Venezuelan struggle for independence would continue for around another 30 years or so before they eventually... Oh, OK. Before Spain actually goes, OK, fine. OK, fine. And there's a number of sort of republics... They get mm. they get knocked down and built back up again. Things, yeah. It's like I think it's eighteen fifties that Spain goes. Okay, fine. You can have your. But by eighteen twenty, long before that, McGregor is bored. I've had enough of this now. I need to go and do something new. And decides 
Yes. I've got a new adventure awaiting for me. <gasps> it's a dapper brick. <gasps> time for a drink? Definitely time for a drink. Yes, time for a drink. Nick, we have our drinks. We do. Okay. So, oh, McGregor. Oh, McGregor. He had a farm. He had a farm. He had a farm. (laughs) farm. Uh, McDonald had a farm. Mm. His was was much more blingy. The geese were magnificent. (laughs) It was terrifying. (laughs) Okay. So, they've gone to Curacao. Yes, they've gone Um, to Curacao. They've gone to Curacao. Uh, Now, now what's happening? (laughs) So, now. So, he does a lot of stuff. (laughs) <laughs> there, so we're, 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 we're going to jump forward a bit. So okay, nice, we're going to nice, jump nice, forward nice. to 1820. In the meantime, he has done he has done a variety of madcap things. Yeah. At one point, he tries to invade Florida. Um, <laughs> again, which at the time is still under control of the Spanish. He thinks he's going to get support from the US yeah. um, government to sort of try and invade Florida. Doesn't quite go so well. He ends up, another point, sort of commanding his own little private army. Yeah. That sort of rebel when they work out he can't afford to pay them. So he's involved in a whole manner of madcap sort of schemes. But we're gonna we're gonna jump to eighteen twenty. <laughs> when he is say he's still in South America, he's bobbling around the place and he sort of comes across this sort of empty stretch of land on the coast of Nicaragua. No. <laughs> nice. Big old tracts of land. Now the cher- the territory is controlled by the Mosquito people. They are a tribe of indigenous Americans who have mixed with African slaves who have been shipwrecked mm. in South America. So there's sort of the combination of the two mm. cultures there. So they they are sort of controlling this area. Mm. Now the inhabitants think there's actually very little use for this land at yeah. all. It's, it's there. It's on the coast. It's a bit swampy. It's a bit boggy. There's no really use for us at all. But McGregor. He is there, and he seems obsessed by it. Yeah, he thinks there's this huge amount of undeveloped, unclaimed mm. as far as he, land that he's, he's, he can see, and he starts to dream, and he starts to dream big. Really, mm. all his life, he's he's generally thought fought for others, for either for for the British or for the Venezuelans or for whoever. Mm. But what if he had his own? His own thing that he could fight for. Something of what his own. He Something have... he could call his own. What, his own what land. if his own land, his own colony? That'd be so much better <laughs> than working for other people. Okay. And especially because he's been around all these sort of failed and warring colonies around the Carib- Caribbean and well, I guess South gotten, America. He's had notions uh, before. He's got yeah, bigger notions. So he's now. going, oh. I could do something great with this. Oh, for God's I sake. could do something absolutely incredible. So he enters into negotiations with the mosquito people and soon he has agreed he has obtained a vast territory Mm -hmm. now it's a territory that is actually about the size of wales so Mm -hmm. we're looking at a piece of land around about eight and a half thousand square miles Nice. so it's a big old chunk of land yes that he manages to sort of negotiate for rum and jewelry (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so i was like oh oh okay yeah, so that's, no. i will sell a lot of things for rum <laughs> rum and jewelry and he gets whales <laughs> <laughs> a piece of land that's the size of whales now nice okay. he's there thinking this this could be paradise this could be his own private kingdom and he could make fantastic things happened here could he could he though what's he thinking <laughs> like a house well no i mean he's thinking he's gonna start his own empire well, He's yeah, his own, his, society. his own I'll be, society. Oh, you petty, petty white man. <laughs> I'm going to start an area and I'll be king of I'll everything. I'll be king. Everyone will come to my parties. And unless you're mean to me, then I won't invite you to my parties. Oh, grow up. Yep. He names the land Poyais. Mm-hmm. And crowns himself means- prince. I don't actually know what it means. Oh, okay. I'm not sure yet, but that's the name he chooses for this land. Oh, yes. And he crowns himself prince. Of course he does. Of yeah. the land. Not so, quite king. Not quite king. Well, there, there, humble, is, there, like. is, there is a king of, supposedly the king of the sort of the local indigenous people who has granted him this land. So he says, okay, fine. He's the king. I shall be a prince. So he has the land. He has the title. He has the ambition. Yes. Now what he needs, he needs settlers and he needs investors. To make Hi. this dream yeah. come come reality, Set to make this clear. work. In 1821, he returns to London to drum up the money mm. for his new land. Mm-hmm. Now, by this point, Britain had been at war for the best, on and off, for the best part of 20 years or yeah, so. Yeah. So everyone is fed up. <laughs> everyone is demoralised yeah. and desperate for escape, for oh, something new, something, something exciting and better and... Beautiful oh, climate. Beautiful climate. Blue so, seas. This is, this is exactly what he has to offer. Mm. 
This is exactly what McGregor has to offer. His reputation as a war hero in South America has sort of preceded him, and it does open many, many doors Mm -hmm. to get into the higher levels of society. And when he's there, he oozes charm and charisma. He styles himself as His Serene Highness Gregor El General McGregor, the Kazik of Poyas. Kazik being prince or... Okay. And he paints a true fairy tale picture mm. of the land. Now, according to him, Poyas is a paradise. There's a perpetual summer. Mm-hmm. The earth is fertile and rich. I mean, you hardly need to farm. You just drop seeds in the ground <laughs> and things grow yeah, all no over birds. the place. Yeah. There's majestic mountains full of gold and precious <sighs> gems, great forests of redwood trees. It's far as the eye can see. There's an Agroni river. I mean, there are great rivers full of fish (laughs) sort of flowing into the sea by golden beaches. Unicorns vomit diamonds. (laughs) There are sort of leafy roadways that traverse the country sort of from like cotton plantation and sugar and coffee and sorry you uh, built up to everything else and you went leafy roadways leafy that's, roadways I don't think that's no, what no. anyone's looking for Everyone. sorry I love the rivers and I love the mountains and the gold and everything is there a leafy roadway there's a leafy <laughs> roadway things are already established things are happening there there's roads um, there are roads there are vast <laughs> herds of wildebeest <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I mean, it is a true utopia. It <laughs> right. really is. Anyone who's uh, listening to him going, like, you had me at like fancy fish yeah. in the river. Okay? No, I mean, please stop talking. I mean, I mean, he does. He continues. I mean, near yeah. the near the mouth of this uh, um, a particular broad river, it is spanned by beautiful stone bridges. Is the, the capital city of Poyas. Mm. It looks o- eastwards over the Atlantic Ocean. There mm. are tree-lined boulevards. There's a royal palace and parliament buildings. There's opera house, cathedral, mm. there's mansions and banks and merchant houses. All of this sort of trading and flourishing. It is a utopia, a true utopia of a place to be. He goes as far as appointing a diplomatic mission he actually appoints an ambassador to oversee the yeah the diplomatic relations between Poyais and Great Britain. Now, London, and soon the entire country, is enthralled by the tales of this sort of dream city, this dream country. It's, it sounds it is a paradise, absolutely. Now, engravings are produced about with the vistas mm. of all the lovely places, showing the yeah, the incredible landscapes and cities. Offices open in London and Edinburgh and a few other major cities where land in Poyais is Mm. sold over the counter. Anyone can go and buy a plot of land, invest in this this utopia. They start at two shillings an acre. Demand is crazy. Four shillings, six Mm. shillings. There is still a queue around the block of people wanting to buy property. A chap, Thomas Strangeways. Now, he is supposedly, I say supposedly, a captain in the native Poyan regiment. And he publishes a 365-page guide and handbook to the country of Poyas for prospective colonists, investors, and things. And it is a book you can actually find now and buy. Yeah, it's a mm. lot of padding. It's a lot of that, work. That's longer that goes, than most novels. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a huge amount of work that has, got, that has gone into this. And it has got maps. And again, f- further illustrations and drawings and yeah. details about the customs of the country and, and its trade relations and all this sort of stuff. Mm. Applications pour in from everywhere. People are desperate to invest and to move to this this paradise across the ocean mm-hmm. he he hires bards who stand on street <laughs> corners and sing traditional pay songs oh good lord <laughs> and things okay, to and that that enthrall people and about the glories of the city all the all the meanwhile he the prince is sort of touring the country visiting the great and the good getting investment on the 10th of September, 1822, the first party of around 75 settlers set off from mm-hmm. Leith. 
They are on a ship known as called the Honduras Packet. Then, October the following month, another 150 set sail on another boat, both mm-hmm. bound for Paes. So most of these people, they are farmers, they're laborers. They have spent their life savings on plots yeah. of land and to get on the boat. There are a few craftsmen and artisans. There are other sort of more professional people who are there to undertake the more serious business of running the country. Now, very conveniently for all these passengers, it it had been arranged that they would actually exchange all their English money, all their pounds, into Poyais banknotes Mm. before they leave Scotland. Okay. And McGregor actually managed to convince the Bank of Scotland to produce Poyais banknotes. They are producing okay, Poise notes, quite the indeed, <laughs> and because they're convinced this is going to make them a fortune. So mm-hmm. people are handing over their life savings in exchange for these notes, thinking, "Well, sure. it, it does make sense." When you get off the boat, you don't really faff around trying to find a bureau de change, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Famously, you don't. Yeah, it's, yeah. Okay. If you just it's got one the... guy with just a small tiki hut, like hello, bureau exactly. de change. If you've got the local currency, so much easier. Yeah. Get a cab. Get a Coke, it's fine. Yeah, what the fuck are you buying out there as well? <laughs> You're settling. You're like, oh, hold on. Yes, where's your nearest laundress? Yes. In early 1823, the ships arrive on the other side of the ocean, supposedly at the grand capital of Poyais. Mm-hmm. The excited settlers, knowing the suit arrived, they all put on their Sunday best going out. They're it's all it's preparing. They are all sort of straining to be the first to catch a glimpse of sort of the spires of the city, mm-hmm. the towers. And there's nothing. No. There's, there's nothing. They get to where they're supposed to be and there's nothing. The ship fires a gun to sort of try and get someone's attention and they wait. <laughs> and they wait. <laughs> and they wait a bit longer. Now, the settlers still believing, well, the city, we must be slightly, of course, the city must be like north and south of here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we must have passed it or we haven't gone far enough. Who knows? So they decide, okay, fine. We will go ashore. We will go ashore here and we will send people north and south to Scouting. have a look, to scout yeah. out. And they will find someone soon enough who will direct us. It's just over that bridge. It's just, exactly. It's just over that bridge. Just behind that tree is a massive city that you exactly. can't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So they Im- disembark onto this beach. It's a um, muddy, swampy, oh, mosquito God. infested. No wonder that the, the location now has the moniker the Mosquito Coast. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, but they're there going, it's fine. It's fine. It's probably just over, exactly, say, just over that ridge. It's, mm. absolutely, it's absolutely fine. I just like, okay, we might be here for a while while these parties go and find find people. So they set up whatever little make- makeshift shelters and things mm. they, they can. And they're there. And they're there, and the days go past, and they're still there, and these exploring parties, no one's coming back. And then they see another ship on the horizon. More settlers? They they, they think initially, okay, this is someone, this is a ship from Poise who's come to, they know we've gone off course, they've come looking for us, they've come to rescue us, absolutely. But no, exactly, it is the next ship of settlers. This is 150 men, women, and children coming across. And they're there going, hey, we're in Poyais. What? Uh, where's the city? Where's the lovely city of where's gold? Where's the city of gold? What's going on? Where's the on? magical <laughs> river? <laughs> so, where are the unicorns? Yeah, where are the unicorns? What's going on? Oh, so Jesus. So they start to disembark as well, and they get their belongings onto the shore. Mm. As they're in the process of doing this, which takes several days, really, to, to unload everything, a hurricane strikes. Aye on the coast both ships are lost oh they are fuck. swept out to sea and wrecked the scant little settlement that they had managed to construct the shelter blown to pieces they are entirely now exposed oh, in the, <laughs> in the, the the beating sort of caribbean sun down there in the middle of a swamp sickness starts to take hold well yeah there's a lot of mosquitoes a lot of mosquitoes malaria Mal- yellow fever uh, all starts to, and people not start, quite the paradise not <laughs> quite the paradise they were hoping oh, for no. and people start dropping dead uh, now eventually news reaches honduras which uh-huh. is another british colony yes. and they're about these stranded colonists and the governor there sends a ship to mm. go to go and rescue them so right go and get them by the time though by the time this ship arrives two-thirds of the colonists are dead <gasps> out of, sort of two around 200 people 
who have who were sort of landed. Oh, that's not good. Two thirds have died from malnutrition, disease, uh, just being lost and in the jungle. Yeah. Oh my things. god. The rest are rescued and taken to Honduras, where again more still die of their their illnesses, but some do survive. But they've lost everything. Yeah. They have absolutely have lost faith. everything. They are entirely, they are absolutely distraught. This yeah. mythical land that they were that sure they was, invested that in, they that invested they invested their lives in, all of their in, money in, has, is, is a hoax, nothing. Is, is utter bollocks. They have lost everything. Now, the governor of Honduras, he dispatches a ship to go back to London to tell mm. people, this is bollocks. Stop, send, <laughs> stop sending people here because there's nothing there but swamp there's and nothing. death. Yeah. So do not come. But obviously, this terrifying. ships take a long time to get back and forth. So meanwhile, back in London, Poirier's fever is still yeah, bloody everyone's mad. Selling their, everyone everyone's is buying. having a grand old time. Oh, Gregor God. is promising more and more extravagant for rewards for yeah. those who follow him to this magical land. He approaches banks and he is able to take out loans against the national resources of Poyes. Christ. In Christ. It, <laughs> so in, on one, in one bank, he takes out a £200,000 loan mm. against resources that do not exist. But he is so convincing, people mm. sign up for it. He sets up companies to trade in the, the produce of Poyes. In total, seven ships leave England. Yeah. To make the trip across South America to Pais. Thankfully, the governor of Honduras, not only has he sent a ship back to England, but he's actually yeah. dispatched squadrons to try and intercept these other settler ships to go turn around. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's nothing there for you. I'd turn back if I were <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. So just don't. Or go somewhere there is nice <laughs> but <laughs> curacao's lovely this yeah time curacao of year. lovely yeah go to jamaica come to honduras yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, there's lovely places come to honduras Poyos, the fish is you lovely. will die if you continue <laughs> <laughs> so by the end of 1823 gregor he's quietly slipped out of london mm -hmm. and he's gone to france now purportedly this is to gather new investors new settlers from paris yeah. there must be more people in europe who want to take advantage of such an amazing opportunity when he's in paris news from honduras arrives that this is all bollocks yeah. this the, the news that this, this colony does not exist this country does not exist mm -hmm. these great cities and things they are not there and the entire country erupts into outrage <laughs> that how could this man have taken so much money from so many people from yeah so many, how could he have yeah uh, abused so many people taken people's life savings and then also how the hell did we fall for this yeah. how the hell do people fall for this utter nonsense mm. but by this time he's in france oh yeah he's having a granddaughter now news quickly reaches france this is all bollocks so yeah in france he's almost lynched by a mob wanting their money back. So he yeah. actually returns to London. In an effort to, f to flee, flee France, flee, yes. he returns to London. And he goes, what the hell are you doing back in London? You're a wanted man yeah. back in London. And he is arrested yeah. for his crimes. However, in London, he seemingly still has enough friends in high places mm -hmm. or enough people who have invested and don't want to be embarrassed, well... potentially, that the charges are dropped mm -hmm. and he is let go with no charges no repercussions uh -huh. for the hundreds of thousands of pounds There's enough he people has that you can swindled out of people you can sort of like cascade it down though yeah. it's not him it's Some, not him yeah. it's someone else someone else yeah. messed it up and many many people still believe or did, did believe that it was it wasn't him it was the ship's captain who dropped yeah. them to the wrong place yeah, yeah. it was yeah it was all various other people Poi you still can spin exists, everything, yeah. but yeah exactly but it was spanning so many different ways so he is released. He flees back to France. Mm -hmm. In France, in Paris, they go, no, get out of Paris. He's kicked out of Paris. He settles in France with a huge amount of money that he's still got his mm. his riches that he's got out of everyone he's still got that but all his now his sort of co-conspirators the people who acted as his ambassadors and ship's captains things mm. they are all siphoning off their own their own mm -hmm. amounts of cash from his yeah his lump sum and soon that depletes soon yeah. that that is fast going down and he is not one to live subtly either or cheaply so yeah Thanks his me. his money is soon dwindling in 1839 he is penniless and friendless Wow. abandoned in france he appeals to the venezuelan government for assistance he had been 
a, a great service to them during his time during their in- water independence. He had served them honorably, and some of his old comrades were now in positions of, of, of considerable influence in the government. They give him a home in Caracas. They restore him to his rank of general uh-huh. division right. and provide him with a generous pension to which to live out the rest of his years in comfort. Right. That is the delightful oh, story God. of Gregor McGregor, who swindled thousands of people <laughs> out of a huge amount of money, killed many hundreds oh my uh, God. by abandoning them in South America. And was generally a bit of an arse. Bit of an arse. <laughs> bit of a glitzy arse, yes. Yeah. So there's, I mean, how many people died? Do we know? Well, about about two thirds of the 200. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the 200. <laughs> Sorry. So you're looking around sort of, yeah, 120, 130 odd sort of people. Jesus Died Christ. from, yeah, is but, but, you know, and wounds and... All their money lost and all those other people invested oh, their life savings. It is... It's a bit of a fire island. It mm. is the do- if you've not watched that documentary, yeah. one of my favorite documentaries to watch on repeat as well. Never get tired of that. Yeah. That is an interesting life. Yeah. That is a glitzy glamorous life. A man who's desperate for the glitzy glamorous life. But just gl- desperate to make money. Yeah. Desperate to se- will just sell anything to anyone. Had no qualms of having all these campaigns to say, "Oh, well this is the new paradise and mm. you'll have a wonderful place and there's a city there and everything. Just give me your money." Yeah. And literally fucked over people. It's quite a leap in a way, really, to go to mass swindling <laughs> and go, well, they're just across the ocean. They're not my problem yeah, anymore. Exactly, yeah. To send off the boats. Once the boats leave, nah, they won't, we won't see them again. <laughs> yeah, chilling. Chilling kind of reflection of today, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Christ. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but the lengths he went to, I mean, he had maps drawn up. He had these, yeah, 365 page if you're going to have a con, you lean into um, yeah, it. That, exactly. That, that the most successful Flags, con artists. banknotes, all this sort yeah. of stuff that were, that were created about this entirely Ooh. imaginary country. See, I love this because I do love, I know I mentioned Fire Island, love the, the, the glamour cons mm. that are out there. You know, when you look at the documentaries, the people who so committed to a lifestyle and so committed to the lie... To the point where they were spending money. They were, you know, saying it's not just sort of going, oh, well, believe me. Like, you put so much money into creating this myth in order to make millions, mm. obviously, is the long con. That takes balls. Oh, dear. He, he was a shit. He was a yeah. shit. And he was into the glamour. Clearly. He, he, he loved the bling. He looked at it. Well, guys, what do you think? What do you think of the story of Gregor McGregor, McGregor McGregor, Sir Lordy McGregor, yes. Colonel Martel, better, better, better. Sir Gregor McGregor. Yes, Colonel, Major, Sir Lord, King, Prince, everything. He had King in there at some point. You I'm know sure he, he was telling people, I'm really the King, I'm really the King. <laughs> what do you think of his story? What do you think of his, all of his methods and his swindling? What do you think of his early years as well, his determination to be someone in society and how he moved around? Tell us what you think. Jump on the comments of this episode. Share your thoughts, your feelings, your theories. But while you're doing that, why not mix up an old flame? Hi, went down a treat. It was fine. It was good. Yeah. It was that was an interesting one that we I would very much recommend people try because yeah. I'd like to know what people think. Yeah, give it a go. Yeah. The recipe will be out this evening. So yeah, do mix it up if you can and let us know what you think. And keep sending us pictures of cocktails you're enjoying or other videos of cocktails that you have found. We love to see those ones. People keep just sending us weird stuff on love Instagram. And it's good. It makes us go, well, maybe someday in the future. Usually they're <laughs> terrible, though. Usually they're <laughs> the cocktails that should not be made. And if you can, please join us on patreon.com forward slash the poisonous cabinet. And if you love the show, leave us a five star review on Apple iTunes, predominantly anywhere you listen to the podcast. Any podcast that you like, five star reviews make the world of difference. So please consider doing that for a couple of minutes if you can. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.